Welcome everyone to the What Can You Do to Help Reduce Climate Change that session number three of the Climate Forum. My name is Tim Hilge. My name is Tim Hilge. I'll be moderating today. Uh, I'll also be presenting a very brief uh, session about my electric vehicle. We were going to have another EV person here, but the, she was not able to attend. So uh, if you can't hear me, just do, you know raise your voice, and I will try to speak up and speak more loudly. Um, so I'm the chair of the Deerfield Conservation Commission, and I'm a former journalist who wrote about science and business news. Wow. And, and I have um, 41 solar panels on my house. <laughs> I was going to ask our representatives about whether we could get colas for the amount of solar panels you can have on your house, because as many of you know, you can't uh, currently exceed a certain level before Eversource tells you, we're gonna start taking away your energy credit uh, for producing energy and putting it into the grid. Um, so I'd like to see a COLA for solar power. Um, so if you think that's a good idea, we should write your legislators. Um, currently our 41 panels on our home take care of all of our electrical needs. We have a negative electric bill and I don't go to the gas station anymore except for my tractor. Yeah. Well, we'll get an electric tractor. Yeah. <laughs> I'll borrow your credit card. Mm. Uh, but I do think it's, a, it's coming, and it's definitely going to be a great thing. Uh, so as you can see, this is my first slide. This is how you charge your, your car. It's a, Tesla is a little more than what I, it's a, it's a spiffy car, and I'm not the spiffy car kind of guy, but it's also the car that has when I purchased mine three years ago, the best range for the amount of money I could afford to spend. So I made this decision, and um, let's see if I can figure this out. And I installed this, which is essentially my gas pump. Um, it's a large, uh, heavy carbon ca uh, car copper cable, and it has a 60 amp circuit on it, and it provides it's turned down so you reduce the risk of uh, fires in your garage to 48 amps, but it, it uh, charges my car to a full 300 mile range in about five hours, five and a half hours. Wow, every night. <laughs> Actually, I don't charge very often. No. No. <laughs> so when I built my garage, I didn't own an EV. So if you are thinking about an EV, one thing you should consider is, where are you gonna put your in-home electrical um, charging station? As you can see, I can back my car in, but it's, it's, I don't have the full driving package, so the car won't back up for itself. <laughs> and uh, so I prefer this method, which is draping the cable over the car, plugging it into the port. And the last thing is, this is the screen inside my car, and it's uh, one of its many functions is to track the amount of power you're putting into your car. And you'll notice that this is where this is a representation of the battery, and you can set how much you want. So manufacturers recommend that you don't overcharge your battery. You, you actually only keep the charge on it if you expect to use over a certain period of time. So ordinarily, you only charge it up to about 80% battery capacity. That helps you to extend the, capacity, the, the, the life of the battery. And when you're going on a big trip, you would go all the way to this end so you can extend the, the range you can travel. Um, so um, since the, there'll be plenty of opportunity to see some of these cars outside, I'm gonna now turn over most of my time to the two other presenters. And I will first uh, introduce uh, Karen Ribeiro. She's an owner of PV Square, and she's going to talk to you about um, design and sales teams and how they uh, work with commercial and residential with commercial and residential <laughs> clients. And over to you. Thank you. Can you tell us how many of your panels it takes to charge your car? I do not because 
since I never have an electric bill, I don't worry about it. But it's a good question, and I should get that answer. Thank you. Can yes. Can I mention something? Number one, there are two things. I own an electric vehicle, and I did have a charger level two put into my garage. You can charge your vehicle on a regular drive outlet. It takes forever. Hi, but Susan. It, it I'm at my a conference, conference giving a presentation uh, today, comma, you know, in person, exclamation point. So I briefly back. looked at what you sent late last night, and I love it. And it'll we'll look at it more closely late this afternoon or this evening, period. And number two, a statistic. If, if a gallon of gasoline is used for a generator and you charge your car on that generator, you could go 80 miles. If you put a gallon of gasoline in a conventional engine, we get 2025. So an electric vehicle uses one gallon of gas to go 80 miles as opposed to a combustion engine. So yeah, I'll add one final thing. Three years I've owned my car, I've paid for electricity in my charging station twice. And it was the two times I took long distance trips. And I averaged 75 miles to the a gallon equivalent on a two-day trip to Florida. And other than those two times, I spent, I think, um, $75 total to drive to Florida and back. Wow. So my sister has a Tesla in Florida, so when I was at her house, I charged up before I left, and I charged up fully before I left my house. And I got to my house at the end of the trip from Florida with about 5% of the battery left. And then I just plugged it in my house and my solar panel did the rest. So if you do, as uh, Rini suggested, plug into a standard outlet without one of these panels, uh, charging stations, you on the Tesla, you only get four, four miles per hour equivalent charge. So in order to say if the battery were 400 miles capacity, it would take you 100 hours to charge it. So that's why you need one of those stations. Oh, I know, but you can always go to one of the local stations. Oh, yeah, I'm just saying yeah. that right. why would you pay for electricity if you have solar panels? Right. But if you don't, of course, you can charge. And I think Greenfield has free free, free charges in, in some of the parking, right. in the parking garage. There's one the Department of Motor Vehicles. Yeah, There's okay, one. and just so that we can get this back on track, we'll, we'll delay questions until after your presentation, and I'll, I'll take questions, or you can take questions. So again, um, it's Karen Ribeiro. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> so I also have an, a, an EV, a plug-in electric hybrid, and um, I plug in overnight. But I have uh, only 20, like I, I used to have 36 miles range. Um, and now the car is three years old, and I get about 20 miles range. Um, and it just degrades pretty quickly. Um, it takes me, you know, maybe six hours to plug in with a regular outlet in my garage. And I almost never use the battery because, you know, I live in Pelham and I, just going uphill, it's gone. So like I might get three miles <laughs> technically. Uh, so I'm looking forward to getting a, a real, a, a, a full electric vehicle at some point. Um, so yeah, as uh, Tim mentioned, I'm with PV Squared Solar. I'm a worker owner. I've been at PV Squared for uh, five years and uh, prior I worked with a couple of other solar companies one of which was Tesla and uh, they, it was called Solar City and uh, I like to say this be, um, and I shouldn't but <laughs> uh, most of the the employees in my division were uh, in Massachusetts and maybe even more throughout the country were let go on Earth Day in 2017 I was already at PV squared um, but I was one of my first customers and I purchased a system from from Solar City and I have had a service issue for many, many years. Uh, so not all solar is built the same. And I'm, I'm, I'm here to talk a little bit about what uh, solar being built correctly, being built well. Um, the title of my presentation is, um, I think, let's see what it is. I wrote it down here. Uh, solar storage and savings. But uh, I want to add service and supply chain to those S's because service, our service team is stellar, another S. Um, and it's very, a very important consideration when thinking about solar energy. 
Um, and supply chain is, is one of those really challenging things that's affecting every industry right now. Um, and uh, the, it's, it's pretty depressing, so I won't say much about that other than to say that it's real, and it's another factor of navigating what I call the solar coaster. It's very wild, and we need to ride that solar coaster safely, which I guess is another S, safe in installation. Uh, we have a really great safety team um, on our installation, uh, for installation in general, so there's a lot of S's to think about with solar. Um, all right, so this is a lovely graphic that m our uh, marketing coordinator um, created, which I wish I had up while I was just talking there. And this is PV squared. Um, this is this was our first gathering uh, post COVID, or you know, like uh, in in the pandemic. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's a lovely, lovely photo that I like to share because uh, getting together, being in person, talking about climate change and doing something proactively together is really what it's all about. Um, and then this uh, was something that was posted on our social media uh, for Women's Day, which was just last month. Um, we have quite a number of women at PV Squared, which is, is really lovely, uh, personally. <laughs> All right, so this slide is an example of um, some of the work that we've done in our 20 years. This is our 20th anniversary, uh, 2022. Um, and let's see, we've, we've done 2,000 projects throughout Western Massachusetts. Um, let's see. And, and while I do, I do commercial and residential, most of our work is residential, most of the volume that we do. Um, but I have two slides here to show you two different worker cooperatives in, uh, two different cooperatives in the area to show the difference between our uh, small scale, like a three, three kilowatt refrigeration unit that we did here, and, and a little bit of our creativity. This is something that is not you know, a cookie cutter project for sure. Um, and then we have another, um, uh, maybe everybody's familiar with River Valley Co-op. We did this project here what'll, on the other end of the spectrum. This is about 170 kilowatts on the roof and 760 or so kilowatts as a carport. And this includes storage. So we've got quite the spectrum of, of capacity at PV squared. Um, but enough about PV squared. Um, <laughs> solar is, is uh, uh, not that complicated, but it usually feels like I'm speaking a foreign language to people because we're not all that familiar with terminology like, I've got some terms here. Um, uh, well, let's see, I don't even know where I am here. I've got the wrong glasses on. <laughs> uh, let's see. I'll get to that in a second. I want to start off by explaining what this is. This is a, a shade assessment, a shade report, and in yellow it shows that if this particular site has a lot of good so solar access, which is one of the really important things here. There's uh, direction, which is called azimuth. We know south is great, um, but east and west is also viable for solar. Uh, slope or tilt or pitch is the angle of your roof and um, east and west if you have a, 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 a lower pitched roof it's actually better for solar because you have more access to the sun um, from the morning to the afternoon um, and then shade shade is the one that's the most challenging we got we love our trees right we love our trees around here and if you have a lot of trees um, you might have a lot of shade which will impact the amount of uh, solar that you can, the, the amount of energy that your solar array could produce on your, on your home. So um, I'm inclined to take questions, but I, I, you know, if you really have a burning question, by all means, lift your hand. Okay. Um, the next, the next slide is the one that I want to spend uh, the most amount of time on. And uh, this the, the terminology uh, that I was mentioning before are things like grid circuits and uh, net 
energy export, DC to AC conversion, or voltage, amperage, interconnection, transformers. Maybe everybody in this room is very, very familiar with those words, but most of my customers kind of glaze over when I start talking about certain things that, can, that are factors of their particular solar project. Um, but basically, you're, you're, you've got DC collectors on your roof, and you, you have conduit that runs to uh, your alternating um, uh, current, or the, the inverter that changes that to alternating current for your home. You can have micro-inverters underneath the panels, or you can have a string or central inverter um, set up here. The meter, you get a net meter, so it runs bi-directional, meaning that the energy that the system is producing um, uh, will power the house, uh, um, and then whatever's extra will be exported to the grid. Um, and the grid, we had some good conversation about the grid this morning with the, our legislators in their presentation. Um, one, one of the the, the single parcel rule uh, and net metering, those, those are real um, uh, sticking points and um, uh, challenges to solar and every site is different. If you live in a city or you're in a, in a dense, densely populated area, you might have a lot of saturation, a lot of solar, a lot of energy demands in your local circuit. And that could mean that the utility would come back to you and say, um, you've got to upgrade that transformer that's right next to your home and that could cost a few thousand dollars. That's a surprise you probably wouldn't be expecting. Um, and one of the things I like to, to say to people, if, if you haven't already gone solar, um, look at your transformer. The, the, it's a canister that's uh, on, on the poles next to your home. And if it's all rusty, just call the, you know, the utility and say, hey, I'm concerned about the transformer. And maybe they'll upgrade it before you go engage with me about a conversation with, about solar and save yourself uh, some money, potentially. It's just an inside uh, a tactic that I like to employ. <laughs> um, so let's see here. What else have I got? Um, the difference between power and energy is really important. Um, for example, if, if you had 10 solar um, uh, panels that were 400 watts each, that would be 4 kilowatts. So power is the, is the amount of the, the energy that, that uh, each unit of uh, each, each panel has the potential of making. Um, but energy is the usable power um, produced over time. In, which, which is in kilowatt hours. So that four kilowatt uh, array could produce, depending on your shade or all the other factors that we just talked about, uh, anywhere from say 3,000 to 5,000 kilowatt hours. And you know with looking at your bill, you've got a certain number of kilowatt hours that you use each month. You add that up and you get the total amount of energy that you're using on a given year. Um, so you, we build solar systems, arrays, to accommodate what you currently use for energy. Um, and we ask, you know, what do you think over time? Are you going to add mini splits? Are you, are you driving an electric vehicle or planning one? I, I use the, the, the uh, figure of 3,000 kilowatt hours a year for uh, an EV. Um, that's, you know, I haven't even checked my own. Is that how much I'm using? I'm not really, char as I mentioned, not really charging my battery that much because it uh, only gets 20 miles range. Uh, so 3,000 kilowatt hours, if you're a very conservative energy user, that could double your, your annual usage. Um, so those are important considerations when we're looking at um, uh, sizing a solar array for someone. So where does the electricity go? We talked a little bit about, uh, first it services the load of the home, and once there's, uh, that's been met, it exports back to the grid, and that's where you get uh, credits on your bill. How many people in the room have solar, power, solar energy? So, so I'm kind of speaking to the choir mostly here. Um, does, any, does anyone have any questions that I haven't already addressed based on, okay, please. I am very curious about batteries. I uh, am a PV Square customer from 2014. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. And I would love to understand something. My understanding is that there's two kinds of 
uh, storage, there's emergency power or there's like the overnight thing and if you want to get off the rig to choose. So could you talk about batteries and, and what kind of things to think about? Yeah, yeah. Supply chain is one of the first things that comes to my mind because people, um, you know, I love the initiative that people want to, you know, do solar plus storage and, and really build your resilience and, and uh, uh, energy security uh, long term. Um, but, but supply chain is really quite an issue. That aside, um, the, there, it, um, depending on the amount of energy that you use in your home, you could have batteries that are backing up your whole home or a, um, a emergency uh, backup circuit, like a, a, a emergency only. Uh, and, and that's something that our installers would work with you on uh, how many circuits are you going to be able to back up with the size of the battery. So. Um, Tesla's, Tesla power walls are, are batteries that we install quite often. Solar edge batteries we install quite often. Um, there are, I'm happy to report, quite a number of new battery options that are entering the residential uh, space. Um, but if we just say, for example, a one battery, five kilowatts, two batteries, 10 kilowatts, you know, that's kind of the, the, the most common amount of batteries, one or two batteries per home. Um, but we've installed uh, six batteries for large homes in the Berkshires. Um, so uh, they just kind of add to, to each other. A, a, an important consideration is new uh, energy code, which requires in, in its municipal uh, based, so it, it, different towns have different um, requirements, but generally speaking, we're looking at having batteries installed in enclosed spaces so that uh, it meets those energy codes and, and fire safety uh, concerns. Um, and those are additional costs to, to consider. Um, The brands, lithium ion or nickel, yeah. Um, I mean, lithium ion is still the most most popular. Um, there, th we could really get into the weeds in conversations about the particulars of batteries. Um, but but to your question, I'm going to give you a, a price amount uh, that that is usually something that people don't don't share because it's so specific. You could you could go to the Tesla website and they'll say, oh, this battery is eight thousand dollars, but but. It, not installed, certainly. And um, if you consider all the, the requirements and the things that need to go into uh, installing that battery, uh, an ins uh, one installed battery is probably going to be about $15,000 to uh, uh, about $27,000. Um, so th that's just a real rough estimate, and, and that could change. Uh, but it gives you an idea of, of like, that could be the same as the cost of the solar array, right? And fortunately, we still have an investment tax credit, a federal tax credit of 26%. That applies to the battery as well. It also applies to uh, the area of your roof if you're re-roofing in order to go solar. A lot of people uh, don't realize that. Um, so one of the things that I, I um, want to talk about today in this space is because it's, we're talking about climate change, um, I personally understand very, very deeply the, the desire to be energy um, resilient and to have storage and so forth. Uh, but I know for, for me and for a lot of my customers, it comes from a place of fear. Um, you know, fear of the future, fear of climate change, and some of the data that we just heard about, it's real and it's right on us. It, it's, it, it, for me, it can be suffocating. And so I try to take that fear and I apply it into action and, and to do uh, policy work and to do whatever I can to connect with people, to even have like, uh, to sit in, in circle and talk about the grief and, and to know that I'm not alone. Very, very important. Um, but I, I wonder often to myself, like, if we were, taking a little bit more steps to have a right relationship with the land and our own, like I'm working very hard to decolonize my mind and to, what does that mean? Like it means it, it's it, to, to really like understand and have that relationship with the land. Um, maybe I'll be less afraid. And so I like to just offer that in this conversation about climate change and, and solar. Do you, Sarah, I just want to give you a nine minute warning. Oh, I still have nine minutes. Well, yeah, Thank you. I'm almost done. Um, so I, I just feel, I yes.
Well, two batteries could give you, you know, it depends on how many hours, right? So if you're going to run um, a pump, it's going to use, it's going to drain your batteries a lot faster than if you're running lights. So um, certainly running a refrigerator and your lights um, uh, and, and maybe a well pump is, is pretty typical for a backup circuit uh, for, for batteries. Um, and, and it's how specific, unfortunately. Yeah, it's, it's like, what are all the components that are going to go into that? If you were to just have a one battery, and again, like if you have a 10 kilowatt solar array, you actually can't have just a five kilowatt for, uh, for Tesla. They, they require that you'd have the same number of, you'd have a 10 kilowatt uh, battery system for a 10 kilowatt or thereabouts, roughly. Um, so it, it really depends on what you want to want, want to back up. So you'd have to look at what's the kilowatt draw of each of the comp of the of the circuits and the components that are on that um, to to right size your storage. Thank you for that question. Oh, the cost coming down. I, I unfortunately I don't, and it's a it's right now it's an issue of supply chain. Um, when when you can't get the supply to meet the demand, the prices stay pretty high. All right, so um, I, I did a look at uh, some of our, the, the work that we've done, 20,000 kilowatts of power that we've installed, 105 million kilowatt hours of energy. It's, it's pretty impressive, but when you look at, um, well not but, but uh, and when you look at what that means in terms of co climate benefits, it's 82,000 tons of, of CO2 avoided. Um, this is also the equivalent of taking, uh, or not taking that many cars off the road, but 185 almost a million uh, miles of a gas-powered vehicle. Um, and one year alone, um, it's 88,000 acres of, of what the forests are doing to uh, sequester carbon. So the, our, our, for, our forests are still the, the heroes in the equation and always will be. Um, and so if in a typical uh, home, 10 kilowatt, uh, system will offset six tons of uh, carbon per year to give to give you uh, some um, comparisons some data points there and I think uh, well obviously you have choice a lot of you have made the choice to to go solar and uh, take action um, uh, and, and saving money is, is also ver a very important part of the equation. Um, I, I uh, want to make another point of um, advocating for environmental justice and, environment, uh, and advocating, like I mentioned, the land justice and, and right relationship with the land. Uh, it's also um, uh, important to realize that uh, the, the uh, um, environmental justice districts are very, very uh, important. Uh, most of my customers are, are not in spaces, uh, in urban spaces uh, where uh, um, they, they are, are struggling to afford solar. And, and I wish that weren't the case. I, I would really like to see solar in more of the spaces where uh, people are struggling financially. Um, so, uh, personally. So, happy customer. Uh, hopefully, thank you for the customers that we do have in the room. And, um, if you would like to get in touch with us. Uh, the, the one thing I didn't mention is um, rights of nature. Uh, there's policy that I, I'm aware of and I've curated. If you're interested in it uh, in terms of, uh, uh, I, I used to be a, a, the, the chair of my select board in Pelham and uh, I didn't know about rights of nature legislation while I was there. If, if you're interested in hearing more about uh, giving uh, actual legal uh, rights to waterways and, and lands in, in your municipality, let me know and I'd be happy to share that with you. Um, thank you. Oh, yeah. Right. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that the, uh, your batteries and your car emissions degraded over time. What's the electric expectancy of the, uh, the battery backup system? Uh, so the warranty is 10 or 12 years. Uh, 
and it really depends on how often it's cycled. Currently, there's a connected solutions program that um, could cycle your battery up to 60 times per summer. Um, uh, I've seen a new battery, uh, it got a 6,000 cycle lifespan. So it really depends on how often you're cycling your battery, the degradation, but it's gonna be roughly, it's gonna be warranted for about 10 or 12 years and it could, uh, it, it could last longer than that, but we don't know. What about cleaning the panels? Does mm -hmm. that improve efficiency? Improve well, panels? yeah, I mean, it depends on where you live. If you live next to a farm and they're kicking up a lot of, uh, you know, we. A lot of pollen. Yeah, a lot of pollen. So we do. Does your company do certain cleaning? We are working on that now. In we, we have, and yes, uh, but it's not a formal service that we offer. But many of our customers are asking us to do that, so we are doing that. It's just not as a, something that I can say, yes, this is how much it is. And one, one other quick thing. Is to add more panels onto an existing grid. So, um, sorry, sorry, yes, she was asking about panel cleaning, and we do do that. Uh, we just don't have a price for it. It's very rare that we do that, but it's, it's something that people are asking more about. Uh, pollen is, is certainly a concern, but please re, 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 resist the temptation to go out there and clean them yourself. Uh, you could scratch you them. You could use your hose, but yeah, but don't like, uh, especially in, when you have snow, like uh, don't use a roof rake yeah, to okay. scratch them, that kind of thing. Spray your hose up there. Yeah, okay. totally. Okay. Yeah. Adding on to it really quickly, is it a complicated, are there still rebates for adding? So you, the, the, your second question is uh, about taking an existing array and, and augmenting that with new, new panels. And so, um, as, as someone alluded to earlier this morning, if you already are at 10 kilowatts with your AC and you want to add another system, you could be into a uh, category where you're not going to get full retail value for your energy that you export. Uh, so that, that is something to consider, but we have people who are doing number twos, number threes, yeah, and, and we're installing the, the EV chargers and batteries and, and, and doing all of that yeah, as well. There are there are uh, the twenty six percent as I mentioned the the tax it's not a rebate it's a tax credit that you'd get in uh, twenty twenty two uh, we're expecting that to step down next year but we have no guidance yet on on what that looks like. So that's for an add on you still get the rebate. You um, you would still get the uh, federal. 26% at this t time. If you did in a second, that would uh, uh, you would not get the state tax credit, which was the 1,000. That's a one-time thing. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, our next uh, presenter is uh, Amy Donovan. She's the program director of Franklin County Solid Waste Management District. The Solid Waste District manages waste programs for 21 member towns and 17 transfer stations and 25 public schools. Ten transfer stations in Franklin County offer free drop-off organics programs for residents in all district schools to divert food waste from trash. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay so um, I have some handouts over here and I brought a worm bin um, but neither of those are in my presentation so I just want to mention those first um, this is the recycle in Western Mass postcard um, and I want to make sure that everybody knows that your recycling really gets recycled in this region um, especially and ma in many most other regions also that don't believe the press don't believe everything you hear even from you know re reputable me news sor sources they're giving the bad news because that's what gets people to tune in they're never covering a model program like we have it here in western mass so if i have two copies of well i have about five copies of these left this is the annual reduce reuse recycle guide that comes out in four area newspapers for Earth Day each year and the 2022 one is coming out on April 20th in the Greenfield Recorder, the Daily Hampshire Gazette, the Amherst Bulletin and the Athol Daily News. Um, it's 32 pages of local accurate up-to-date information written by local recycling coordinators. I head this up with um, my colleague Susan Waite who used to be the Northampton Waste Reduction Coordinator, and now she's the Western Mass Municipal Assistance Coordinator for Mass DEP. So 
take it from the experts, your recycling is really being recycled. So if you have anyone in your life that doesn't believe that recycling is really happening and they live in Western Mass, they're 100% wrong. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm going to save these two copies for naysayers. And the, uh, the main article is on pages three to eight. Um, and it talks about um, what actually happens to our recycling what has happened the past few years in recycling and goes through the different um, different material streams for recyclables and tells a little bit about what happens to each one. So I'm going to reserve these precious few copies for naysayers. Do we have anybody who is a naysayer or has a naysayer in their life who wants one of these? <laughs> Donald Trump. Donald Trump. <laughs> you want one? I, 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 I would like to say that I struggle with my daughter. She, she um, wants to Okay. 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 Please. Okay. Is that like you, you, you mentioned uh, Western Mass specific? Right. How do we differ from other parts of the state? Well, we are really special. Um, <laughs> I'm going to show a slide about this in a minute, but um, our recycling goes to the Springfield MRF, which is owned by the state, which doesn't make that much of a difference, but um, it has a very active advisory board of which I've served for 14 years. And we are making sure that the right thing's happening here in Western Mass. Um, we have dual stream recycling, which means paper and cardboard is kept separate from bottles, cans, and containers. The rest of the state, without exception, does uh, single stream recycling, where all your recyclables go together in one bin. Um, and it's sorted out at recycling facilities that have very expensive, very high tech machinery and people to do that sorting. Um, which a lot of people don't know about, which is shocking to me. Um, and so in Plymouth and other areas, they're doing single stream recycling and the state of Massachusetts is very serious about recycling. And um, all of the MRF operators, there are several um, recycling uh, operation facilities, you know, where it's actually getting sorted in Massachusetts and they're all very serious about recycling. Remember, it's e economics, okay? so. If, um, if a company is uh, buying this material to make something out of, they're not going to go and throw it away. Um, if the waste hauler and the MRF gets this material, it's going to cost them money to throw it away too. Everybody in that system wants this to succeed because of economics. They've got the stuff. They want to sell it. They don't want to throw it away. And um, there's, not, there's diminishing landfill space in the area, which I don't have time to talk about that. Um, but anyway, yes, so economics make, make a lot of um, difference in this. So, so um, there's a great website, Recycle Smart MA, which is in that guide somewhere. Um, and you can get more information about recycling through the state. But the DEP, the haulers, the processors, I just went to the Mass Recycle Conference over the last two days. And there's a lot of really good, smart people working on this. So we got gotcha. you. We got your back, like Lady Gaga. Um, <laughs> OK, so composting. Um, so I wanted to show some pictures of Deerfield, because we're here in Deerfield. This is the Deerfield compost dumpster. It's not beautiful, but it is effective. It's always full. It's always full. Yay! <laughs> so um, I worked with the Deerfield Energy Committee. Thank you to any members, members in the room. None? Oh, wow. Former. Former, right. Uh, and um, and uh, Rini was actually on our, our board of representatives representing Deerfield for many years. How many years? Three. Three? That's it. No, longer than that. I'd say seven, but anyway, M.A. Swedeland is, the, is, uh, is our treasurer. Anyway, so Deerfield Energy Committee helped get this going, um, and we've got this going in 10 towns, similar program. I'll talk about that in a minute. This I took at Frontier, right here. Um, in about, I don't know, 2018 or 19 of the garden compost bin that I installed with some students in the eighth grade environmental club and the existing compost bin that was already here that the school got free from Mass DEP. And I also brought them this compost container. And so this is in the garden here at the school. And so smaller amounts of garden waste and food waste go into there. Well, it could be large amounts of garden waste. But the reason I'm saying smaller amounts is that this Triple T trucking dumpster um, uh, accepts all the food waste from the cafeteria and the kitchen. And that is sent to Martin's Farm, these two, 
uh, in Greenfield for composting. So um, this school composts, as do many in the county. So just a little bit more about trash. The whole reason we do this is to avoid trash, okay? So trash goes to landfills and incinerators, and it does not become soil. Some of my slides are for kids because I do so many presentations in schools. Um, and I have to say this to kids because they don't necessarily know this, that if you put something in a landfill, yeah, you might see some soil here, but the contents are not becoming soil. It's extremely expensive for our towns. We have five years left in Massachusetts landfills. There aren't many landfills left. There are no landfills in Western Massachusetts in all four counties. Um, and it contributes to climate change, which a lot of people don't know that connection. So um, these pictures are of the Chicopee landfill um, and from Mass Live and the local incinerator down in Springfield. Um, the town of Deerfield and, and um, many other towns in the county and in the region have a contract that has failed just last week at Community Eco Power Incinerator uh, Waste to Energy Facility down in Springfield. Um, this facility is one of seven waste incinerators, uh, waste to energy incinerators or combustors that burn municipal solid waste and that burning process creates energy and the um, smokestacks are cleaning um, the the uh, the ash and the and the exhaust from that facility. Um, some people are concerned with incineration, and um, I'm not here to pick sides or talk about anything like that. But it's a moot point anyway, because guess what? This facility became very expensive to keep up to date, and um, started operating in the black because of repairs, and it's closing as we speak. So. What's happening to our contracts? They've gone bankrupt and the contracts are being defaulted on or, or something. I don't know the legal mumbo jumbo of that. So there's a change. Now our waste is going to be put on rail cars and sent to faraway states like Ohio, the Carolinas, you name it. Um, if it's a big state with a lot of land, they've got landfills. Uh, Massachusetts doesn't have a lot of landfills and there's no plans to build anymore. So we're in a tough situation, and what we need to do is reduce our trash. Um, now, I do have some good news on that, so. Um, but first, this slide I love. Recycling goes to the Springfield Materials Recycling Facility, or MRF, which I mentioned earlier. Check out the website, springfieldmurf.org. It's managed by yours truly as a 14-year um, advisory board member. We do a lot of the work of educating. Um, and uh, like I mentioned, the recycle guide comes out every year. This is our 15th annual edition coming out. Um, so the economic situation is this. Um, you've all heard probably that the, the towns were going to be paying 93.50 a ton for recyclable processing. But hey, the pandemic, silver, silver lining. Lots of demand for materials in this country to make products. Um, related to the pandemic and all the things that went with that. So the recycling markets are doing really well right now. And because of the um, stipulations of the contract, our towns are now getting paid $17 a ton this month. Last month it was $6, so it fluctuates. But back in September, it was $38 a ton. Back, we're back in business, back to how it used to be before um, the crash of the recycling markets a few years ago. So we're, we're crossing our fingers and hoping that we can stay there. Now, the towns are paying right now $83 a ton for trash. See the difference? We're getting paid, we're paying out. Now, with this closure of the incinerator, towns are going to be paying up to $97 a ton for trash. So trash disposal is very, very expensive and we really need to do whatever we can to reduce our trash. So. You guys know these, so we're not going to get into this. Composting and recycling, save money, save energy, save water, resources, save the land, like Karen alluded to, the land of our relationship with our, our earth is so important. But a lot of people don't know that there's a climate change connection. By the way, this shows uh, dual stream recycling, okay? So in this bin and this one back here, it's all cardboard, okay? And in this bin over here, it's all containers 
including milk cartons and this half and half container uh, go in the, with the containers with other things that contained food and drink. That's dual stream recycling. In single stream, you just mix that all together like they do in Plymouth and the rest of the state. Okay, so here's the connection. So climate change is caused by greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere. I don't have to tell you folks that. Um, the three main greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. Methane is produced when food waste and paper uh, in landfills starts to degrade and there's a certain set of bacteria in those landfills um, that is anaerobic because the material in the landfill is crushed and smashed and condensed and compacted. And so um, there's a certain set of bacteria, anaerobic bacteria, that eat, 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 eat and digest that material, sort of. As we know, this stuff can stay forever in a landfill. But um, methane is released by that bacteria, OK? Um, so methane is a greenhouse gas that's 28 to 36 times more potent as a global warming gas, a, car, a greenhouse gas, than carbon dioxide. So I like to explain to kids that carbon dioxide is like, you know, you get your like summer blanket that's on your bed that's like that woven and it's light and it's got a little holes in it. Carbon dioxide is like, there's so many of them and they just keep piling up and it's easy to get up there and there's, there's tons of it coming up and it's lo lots of blankets, right? A big stacked up blanket. Well, methane is like a down comforter um, that really traps the heat. You don't even need a blanket with that in your bed. You just have your down comforter and your sheet. Uh, so it's a really effective greenhouse gas um, in a bad way. <laughs> um, so here's a methane pipe at a landfill. Um, this is a mass live photo of the uh, Chicopee landfill when it, w when it is and was being closed. Um, so if anybody drives to, the Bo to Boston or anywhere east and you go down 91 and hook a left on the Mass Pike, um, you're going to be going by this facility. So check it out. It's a huge mountain that was created out of trash. Um, so there's the methane pipes being installed. Um, and those have to vent that methane out because what would happen if they didn't? Blow, blow up, right? <laughs> um, so it has to be there. Now, some landfills are able to capture the methane gas and do things with it, um, like capture it for um, you know, powering things and, and fuel. But um, a lot of the methane releases before the process of capping even happens. Okay, so if you have a lot of wet food waste, it's going to start decaying. Fresh food waste is going to start decaying. Um, and then this process comes along, you know, much later. So the methane has already kind of escaped. And then some, some landfills um, don't capture the methane. In fact, I've, my parents live in the Springfield area and going down to their house at night, I've seen a flame coming out of that facility. Have you seen that too? I didn't imagine it. <laughs> um, so they're burning it off. So that's not, they're not capturing it in, in that case. I don't, I don't know the science. I should find out with everything else I'm doing. So you might say, well, why doesn't composting release methane? And that's because oxygen is part of the compost process. It's aerobic. Um, so no oxygen in a landfill, lots of oxygen in a properly managed compost facility like our own beloved Martin's Farm. So uh, Martin's Farm uh, has these big windrows and um, they're covered with um, a cover here to keep the heat inside. This picture's taken in the winter. They keep going all year round. Um, and these piles, oh, I'm going to talk about that next, about the piles. Um, the windrow turner that's pictured here is in the upright position, okay? So you can see it's like a screw. This goes over the piles and drives along here, and that's what makes the piles have this beautiful pyramid or conical shape. Um, and that windrow turner is introducing oxygen. That's the main purpose of it, to stir that stuff up and get that oxygen in there. So if you have a compost bin at home, hopefully you know that once in a while you should get out there with a shovel or a garden spade or a pitchfork and 
stir that material around. Now you don't have to get like the apple core that was here it doesn't have to be over there and this has to be over here. No, it's just, you just have to like lift up that material and maybe mix it around a little bit um, to get some air in there. There are great tools available. Uh, I've seen great ones at Hadley Garden Center and um, our own Greenfield Farmers Cooperative Exchange that make it easier to stir that up and get that oxygen into, into there. So we're doing it in Franklin County. Martin's Farm in Greenfield is accepting compost, food and paper waste, also called organics. Doesn't have to be organically grown, it's just organically based. Um, from schools, Frontier, Deerfield Elementary School, 20 others in Franklin County, um, plus UMass colleges, places like that, municipal compost programs, Deerfield, Greenfield, Leverett, Northfield, Montague, all go here. Oh, Waitley, how'd you get off my list? <laughs> Waitley, Waitley residents here, Waitley has a very special distinction as being the first town in the state of Massachusetts to have a compost program like it is at their transfer station. They started in 2003, 19 years ago. Um, so uh, I'm just so proud of our towns for offering this. Now, yes, John. Are there any towns in the current No, I was just going to say that. So now Gill doesn't have a transfer station. John is a former Montague Select Board member um, for many years. Um, and so Gill doesn't have a transfer station. Um, Gill could get a dumpster at the um, safety facility. Yeah behind maybe so people aren't abusing it um, but you know there's some reason I, we, we could do that but Gill has curbside so it becomes a little difficult so you can get pick up in Gill through the compost cooperative uh, which is a newer hauling service in Greenfield maybe you've read about them in the paper this is the, um, the um, co-op, worker-owned co-op that uh, employs a lot of, um, or tries to, but yeah, we're getting there, um, employ a lot of um, previously incarcerated people and give them jobs and job training and hope and structure. And um, it's a wonderful, um, it's a wonderful effort. So you could get pickup, you could pay to get pickup. It's not too expensive. Um, the last I looked at it, it was only like $15 a month to have it picked up twice a month. Um, but don't quote me on that because I am not, I don't know their pricing. I'm not with them or anything. Um, so there are options and we are looking, we're always looking, there are no curbside compost programs in Western Mass, not a single one. So we have some, five more minutes? Thank you. We have some, we, we've got dreams, so I would really love to make that happen. So we've looked at it before and we can look at it again. So restaurants are composting, markets, big Y, all the big Y stores, fosters um, compost their cardboard with Martin's Farm. I'm not sure how much food waste they're doing, but I think they are. Um, events like the Franklin County Fair, Heath Fair, and 30 other events are composting every year, regu regular years, no, not pandemic years. There are the windrow turners at Martin's Farm. You can see now that machine part is down in the lower position and they're adding water to it too to keep the, the microorganisms um, well fed and watered. Um, this is a picture of a compost thermometer that's two feet long that, I, that Mar Adam Martin sunk into the pile. I took a picture of it. It was 140 degrees on that particular day, but these get up to 150 degrees. Um, and that's why these programs can accept meat, bones, dairy. Um, it's not the same as your backyard compost bin. So just in case anybody doesn't know what compost is, um, in nature, soil organisms called decomposers transform anything that dies in nature into soil or compost. And when we compost, we're using that natural cycle that happens naturally to dispose of waste and create a nutrient-rich soil amendment or garden gold. And that's why we can do uh, paper. Um, because it comes from trees and can become soil. So on-site composting or home composting um, is wonderful. I'm talking a lot about municipal composting or commercial composting, but I don't want to overlook um, the very important home compost bins that are taking 
everybody's food waste in this region, it seems, in their own backyards. Um, so you can compost fruit, veggies, um, bread, pasta, things like that. Um, typo, ah! Uh, <laughs> and, um, but not meat products. No meat, bones, and cheese, um, because that will attract animals and create problems. Um, you can reduce methane in your own home compost bin by mixing, stirring, um, adding lots of leaves, because think about dry, crunkly leaves. They have air pockets in them, and if they're incorporated into your bin and you stir that around, it's going to be getting some oxygen into there. Uh, leaves also add the carbon that is necessary for the food waste in there to break down. So if you're composting, you should be adding leaves to your bin, like in the fall, add a lot of leaves, maybe save some leaves so you can add them through the year. In the spring, when you do your cleanup, um, wait a little while to do your cleanup, please, because we've got to let pollinators who are hatching from your garden debris all around your yard to live and to, to get out of there and, and live. So, um, okay, so you can buy home compost bins at cost um, at our offices, newly located at, on Main Street in Greenfield. We used to be down by the Energy Park. We moved right before the pandemic to Main Street. Um, we sell them to towns that compost. Residents can get them for $25. That's really, really low cost. And if your town doesn't compost, um, it's 55. And you can also get them at three transfer stations in the county. Um, this, this is a, a handout that's on the back of this. Okay, this is from the Mass DEP. It says composting is easy at the top, and it's true. Um, and this is about adding three parts brown carbon rich material to your one part green nitrogen rich material. That's your food waste. So if you're going out to your compost bin and just dumping food waste all the time, you probably don't have the right ratio of browns to greens. Um, so the brown materials are leaves, straw, salt marsh hay, shredded paper and cardboard, and finished compost. So if your bin is starting to fill up with finished compost, you might have enough, but it's always good to add leaves. Okay, Tim, let me just see what I, what I missed here. Oh, we sell these compost kitchen compost collection pails um, at our offices, and many towns have them. The town of Deerfield got them um, when the compost program started and gave them out to their residents for free. We always have these. We always have compost bins and pails, the solid waste district. We don't run out of them. We take it pretty seriously. Just want to flip through these pictures really quick. There's the Northfield and Deerfield transfer stations um, that have this program. Um, the 11 towns that have this program are Bernardston, Deerfield, Greenfield, Leverett, Montague, New Salem, Northfield, Orange, Wendell, and Waitley. Conway had to pause their program, but we're hoping to get them back going soon. Um, this just says that, yes, it's all types of food except liquids, plus paper towels, paper napkins, paper, paper takeout containers. There's the Deerfield program, Greenfield. If you don't live in any of the towns that have a program, you can go to Greenfield Transfer Station, pay $5 host fee, and use their dumpster. And this just shows how many of these programs we have throughout the county. Um, and this shows that we have less trash in this region because of all of our great efforts and conscientious um, residents. There's two other factors that affect that, and that is we don't have a lot of stores, and we do have, um, we are the um, lowest economic county in the state, I believe. And. Franklin County Fair compost, we always need volunteers. I want to make sure I say that. Um, I, I need volunteers of all ages, abilities, and, and individuals, students, groups, anybody. And there's my contact information. Kids love composting, don't forget. <laughs> so uh, I hope you found this informative, so give a big hand for the presenters. Um, you want to pigeonhole these folks afterwards? Lunch is uh, oh, and I brought my worm bin, which is not good to look at right before lunch, but um, it's, um, does anyone smell anything? Okay, we got composting happening right here. Lots of oxygen here because the worms are mixing it around. These are red wigglers. I'm going to add some um, 
crushed eggshells to it right now today. If anybody wants to see it, come on up and I can take questions. I'll be hanging around here for a while. Thanks everybody. And take handouts, handouts.